The yes. first question I have for you okay. is, and either of you can, you can both answer this. All I know, you can both answer this. You can answer this separately. All I know is I'm not allowed to answer it because I'm not in the group. I'm just here to like, <laughs> facilitate the group. So, so, so why did you write this book? And let's actually mention you, you have, this is, is this a follow-up? Is this like a sequel to your first book? Why did you write this book? Okay, I'm going to take the lead on this one because I was the one who texted Katie at an obscene hour on Pacific Standard Time saying, hey, I have this idea for a follow-up. What do you think? And Katie was immediately like, yes, let's do this. Teachers are so spread thin and overwhelmed. And I think for me, the first book was really about establishing this synergetic kind of relationship between blended learning and universal design for learning. Like I didn't met anybody who has any issue with the idea of making learning accessible and inclusive and equitable. I think the challenge comes with how do you operationalize that? Like, how do you make it this consistent and effective part of what you do in your lessons and learning experiences? And so I think this is a nice follow-up because it takes these 10 kind of really time-consuming, typically teacher-led, often a little ineffective workflows, and kind of reimagines them from a student-led perspective that's much more sustainable. The idea being like, let's give teachers strategies so that they can kind of spend more time first outside of school on themselves, resting, recharging, connecting with other people in their lives, but also when they're in class, really allowing students to lead the learning and freeing themselves from, you know, whether it's standing at the front of the room, talking at kids or facilitating whole group discussions or grading everything kids touch and really thinking about how do we cultivate these expert learners who are able to share the responsibility of learning with us. And it's not to say teachers can't lead anything it's like let's just not lead everything and katie what would you say i mean i would say that that's exactly where it's at is people are working too hard right now to not have a greater impact on all kids mm -hmm. and i think that many of us were just simply our own education and the way that we were trained to be educators very much gave us the responsibility of learning, right? That like, if kids don't learn, it is the teacher's responsibility, not recognizing that it is like within the relationship that learning really happens, that we want to make sure that every learner can be in a class and that they learn given the pathways that they need. But I don't know what every single student needs I need them to kind of co-create some of those options with me. And so when we take all of the ownership and all of the responsibility, students don't have to do the cognitive work to be really engaged, to really personalize their learning. And we've talked about this before, George, is that it's not my responsibility to try to like figure out and give every student what they need. It's my responsibility to recognize that one size fits all isn't working and then together say, okay, so what are some other ways that we can do this? Right. And then as a facilitator, I am much more effective because I can really target that feedback and instruction.